that. So you can do that button up again mm. now if you want. Okay. Um, as a child, I think, yeah, I was very inquisitive uh, and liked to know how things work and it was probably a real pain in the arse to teachers and so on. I think one of the key things is you want to know why things work, why they happen and what you can do about changing them. Um, good example, getting into trouble when I was five. Um, there was an area of um, what I now realise was cement on the playground at school and uh, so what I did of course, everyone else was avoiding running over it. I thought well why are they doing that so why don't I run over it? So I ran over it and of course there's a footprint left uh, in the wet drying concrete uh, and so it's certainly quite difficult to try and deny that you're guilty because clearly you're going to get matched up and there I was and uh, arrayed in front of the whole school as, as the guilty culprit. So. But I just wanted to find out why people were avoiding it. Well, bizarrely enough, it was the same year, I actually subsequently found out, it was the same year that, that one of the first papers in a uh, technique called molecular imprinting came out, uh, which I ended up being involved with quite a bit uh, for quite a few years. So it was a little bit bizarre, it was sort of serendipity, I guess. Yeah, um, so a guy called Doc Powell who was really good, I mean he was a geochemist and uh, he just made chemists chemistry interesting. He had a quite nice sarcastic sense of humour as well and I think one of the things that I really liked was that we had a chance to experiment, we had a chance to do things in the lab ourselves. Uh, so you did have the freedom to, to just to try things. Well it's just, just perhaps the ability that he had to um, get you engaged in a subject but I think the, the difficult thing is you, you want to allow children to have the freedom. I mean I guess I was 11 or 12 when I first started taking lessons from him but you want to allow people to have the freedom to try different things out, but not be too worried about health and safety. So there is always that, that potential contradiction of letting children do what they want and then coming back to a school in smoking ruins. So. What we try and do um, in my lab and in the groups here uh, is we try and develop materials which will carry drugs to particular targets in the body. So, for instance, things like anti-cancer drugs uh, work, a lot of them work, by being primarily toxic, so they, they kill the uh, cancer cells. Now, one of the issues is they, of course, kill other cells, it's just that they kill cancer cells more quickly. And so one of the things that we try to do is develop materials which will carry those drugs and will hide them from the body, uh, much like a Russian doll type thing. So the, the material will be carried inside a container, and then when it reaches the site in the body that's going to have its action, then the drug will be released or the particular compound will, will be released to have its therapeutic effect. So we really want to make carriers and we want to make carriers which are, which are smart, which have some kind of property which will, the body won't necessarily recognise them until it's too late if you, if you want to try and kill a cancer cell or the body will take it up and say yes we really want this molecule, that will help uh, to restore damaged tissue or something like that. Okay, the best, the best bit of the job is working with some really talented people around. That's just fantastic. And you get um, my current research group, you get research students, postdoctoral scientists coming into my office and thinking, you know, telling me some new bit of data, something that's never been done before. And the analogy I like to think about it is, you know, days gone by I used to go into the mountains and still do whenever I can. And it's like climbing you know, a major peak and you these kind of days when students come into, into your office and you get to the top and you realise you've done something that no one has ever done before, you're on a peak that no one's been on before and it's just a fantastic feeling. Now of course the flip side of that is often you get to a top of a peak and you see all these other mountains there are to climb around you so there's, there's always you know, each question that you answer opens up a whole range more and the worst side of the job that is the again to go back to the mountain analogy if you go walking climbing in Scotland I've done many years a lot of the time you're struggling around in the mist, you don't know where you're going, you've got a really big uphill struggle and that I, I think is like getting trying to get funding for the work that you want to do. There's an awful lot of uh, reading, writing, a lot of hard graft and you know very long hours, just as it would be on a major mountain climb. But when you get to the top and you, you, know, you don't get to every top, but when you do then it's just a fantastic feeling. Yeah, the next 12 months we, we have a number of key experiments coming up uh, in probably about the next month, the next two months, where we will start seeing whether some um, materials which will form artificial chemical cells, whether they start talking to uh, real cells. So whether our artificial chemical systems will start having some kind of feedback 
or talking to some biological systems. So that's an absolutely key moment. We also have um, quite a large consortium developing together where we're looking at a whole new generation of anti-cancer medicines. And we'll know about the funding shortly on that, and if we do get that, then that'll be a pretty major initiative. In terms of other research goals, we've got a, a number of materials uh, which we're looking at in terms of gene therapy, and we have uh, some indications, and these, these are a bit like these uh, Russian doll things. We've got a two-layer Russian doll, we're trying to develop a three-layer Russian doll, and if we can do that, then we've got a very good chance of making some materials which will be you know, ten times more effective than the, the current materials we have in the lab. So those are key goals in the next 12 months. Well, I think, I guess the key thing would be these sort of self-adapting medicines. We really want to have something that, something that, a medicine that you don't even know you're taking, if you like. You have a system which can perhaps be circulating in your bloodstream that will react, it will know perhaps any predisposition to illness that you may have, will dispense something if it's needed to or issue a warning signal in case there's some kind of disease factor that is beginning to be there so that you you really you don't have this kind of concept of visiting a doctor or anything like that that the medicines are inbuilt in situ and of course they can adapt to the environment because it's not just your genes that dictate how you are it's your environment as well and these two things interplay so we want to have some kind of system that will will acknowledge all those things. So it's some truly smart medicines and to be involved with something like that would be great. But the medical stuff, people can understand that, that's, that's fine. People know that there is no one cure for cancer now and there never will be. It's a complicated disease and so on. So that's absolutely fine. When you start talking about materials which will adapt to biology, and perhaps artificial materials which will behave in some ways like ordinary cells, then that's clearly an issue because people do, and I think rightly so, have some fears that we have, you know, we're creating something that we don't understand. So I guess people relate to that a little bit less easy. But if you then say, well, actually, we want to have something which will mean you don't have to have multiple injections and so on, then I think they can usually see that angle fairly clearly. It can be quite difficult. I mean, the best thing is to start thinking about analogies. And I think you know, the idea of Russian dolls, Trojan horses, that that's absolutely fine. When you start thinking about uh, you know, synthetic life or any other kind of thing, you know, what it is to be alive, then that's, that's a difficult thing, it's a difficult thing for philosophers and it's not an easy concept to get across in the pub after 15 pints, so it's, uh, you know, clearly you have to put, uh, couch things in analogies, but people are not stupid and I think in any field that you're in, you know, you, you make things accessible in terms that most people can understand. A stereotypical scientist. What is a stereotypical scientist and are you one? <laughs> yeah, the boffin question. Um, yeah, I mean, people do think of the scientists as, as a sort of nerdy geek, usually male, um, usually white. Uh, and I think, you know, there's something that as a scientist you do have to be aware of those preconceptions. But, you know, science is a, is a social occupation just like anything else. We do things in big teams. We have our good days, we have our bad days. In that sense, it's like any other job. I guess where it's not um, like any other job is that it's sometimes it's quite difficult to let go because you've got, you're on the verge of a big discovery. It's big competition in that sense. You might be like a, you know, a member of a big football team or something like that. You've got to get there first. You've got to, you know, you've got to score the goal before the opposition does. So, you know, we're competitive people. But I don't think we're, I think the stereotypes are, are lagging a little bit behind, but we have to change that. Yeah, in, in other times, then uh, when life's not busy in the lab uh, or in the office, then uh, mountaineering is something that I've always liked to do. Uh, every now and then I play drums, but uh, I've been in a band for quite a few years. We've done a bit of recording. Uh, that's, drumming is a great way to get around the frustrations. When you have a grant rejected, you've done a lot of work, then just smack the hell out of a set of drums. is just a good way to get around it. Um, Family, yes, partner, two kids, two young children, and that guess takes up most of my time now. And it's great actually seeing them grow up because well, the kids growing up, I guess me and my partner haven't. Uh, but the thing there is, you know, you can see some aspects of the whole life process mapped out, and that's just great. Not a scientific life. Absolutely love to be a mountain guide. That would just be something because you're just in an environment that you love uh, most of the time. But I guess as with science, you have your bad days there because you know. You'll be in the wind and the rain half the time.